nose. You, or to even debate blowing your nose in the Senate, okay? What you get on the other side of a, of a conference committee is a big deal in the Senate, and that is a privileged document that's guaranteed a vote. You, just, you make a motion and you get a vote on the conference report. And so that, that was, you know, when you talk about the trust that, that absolutely had to be built between Senator Murkowski and Senator Campbell, and from my perspective, has to be built between any chairman and ranking member that wants to legislate seriously on the topic these days. That was a real test because, and it, it took us like a month and a half to get Senator Murkowski and Senator Campbell to a point where they agreed on in a conference committee where there are no rules, what the rules were going to be and how we were going to handle it and what we would and wouldn't do. Um, and so we had a very strong vote to, to go into a conference committee, which is where we're now at, with about an 800-page bill from the Senate that passed on an 85-12 vote, and about an 800-page bill from the House that passed on a party line vote and had a bunch of provisions in it that were subject to veto threats in the state and administration policy. And then we started negotiating again. This time it wasn't just Angela and I and our staff locked in the room. It was um, Angela and I and our staff uh, and the staff directors and staff for five different house committees, 40 house conferees. And we started that work as soon as we were in conference in the middle of July. In July, in August, and September, we had 75 six corners negotiating sessions. Uh, those have averaged about two and a half hours of hop. As many as 14 people, 15 people attending each of those negotiating sessions. And 90 professional staff from all the different committees involved. So, very complicated, very unwieldy, very prone to disagreement and unpleasantness. Um, but but it's, you just have to do that work. You don't, if you want to get a conference report done that is, as our bosses have described, capable of passing both chambers and unlikely to be vetoed by the president, you, you just have to do that work. You can't commit any process fouls. So we're in the thick of it now. Um, and the House folks not being here to defend themselves. You know, I, I think the Senate, at least given where we are, deserves a real pat on the back. I mean, I think sort of sheer force of will from Chairman Murkowski and Ranking Member Cantwell to force people to sit down at the negotiating table to work through some pretty thorny issues. And we obviously won't have anything that can be done until after the election. In the lame duck, but I, I, I would say we're in pretty good shape, um, and and I think it's a testament to the hard work that, that both our bosses have done. Uh, we're in pretty good shape, and I think we're more likely than not to wind up with a, with a conference report that is privileged and will get a vote, um, and uh, and it'll have bipartisan support. That's my best guess. Well, we are in a room full of folks who care a lot about voters. And if we look back at where we were um, in 2007 and 2008, which was on the heels of the Energy Independence and Security Act, and then we rolled into the 2009 uh, stimulus package, a lot has changed since then. We were at huge high oil prices, and then we've plumbed historic lows. Uh, natural gas production is still very prolific. Gas in the pump is pretty reasonable. Uh, at Clearview, we've calculated that energy as a share of the personal consumer expenditures to have declined about 50 basis points every five years in the last 15 years, although it has struck them a little bit of late. Um, that means that wallet share energy has declined from over 6.5% in 2001 down to just over 5% now. Um, both of you have been um, around energy bill uh, negotiations for some time. How does the less expensive energy environment sort of change the dynamic? Um, certainly concerns, as Colin mentioned earlier, about high energy prices can sometimes unify folks in a common direction. Where does these, these historic low energy prices um, leave conferees in, in sort of trying to make things work? And what are the priorities in a low price environment that you don't have to um, he talked for a while. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword. 
as it relates to um, uh, uh, how you uh, gather legislative momentum. Um, certainly, energy is not viewed on Capitol Hill at this time as a crisis, uh, which often will provide the engine to get to get the uh, unwieldy um, process working. However, I would also add that in high price environments, you get an awful lot of bad ideas from the peanut gallery. Um, so, as I said, it's a double-edged sword because the, on the one hand, we've had to sort of manufacture our momentum by running a very regular order process and actually sort of pulling the thread for our members on how dramatically different the world looks today than it did the last time we legislated. That's been a slower process, obviously, and it's taken a lot more, um, uh, you know, shoe leather, uh, to articulate, like look at the level of penetration of renewables, look at the production, um, you know, curves as it relates to natural gas. We got to do something about this as it relates to in, uh, investing in our infrastructure uh, because we are experiencing, you know, different um, uh, uh, impacts on different uh, energy verticals as it relates to infrastructure congestion and things of that nature. So um, it's taking a little bit more. Uh, effort, but at the same time, I think it allows us to have a more sober conversation about some of the long-term priorities uh, that we uh, have all identified as it relates to moving forward on, on energy policy. Yeah, I think that's right. I, the really interesting contrast for me as it relates to energy policy in a low-price environment is between the executive branch rulemakings on the one hand and our efforts to legislate on the other. Um, you know, I, the, the, the sort of cruel irony from my perspective of the domestic success in boosting production is that it's created a low price environment that makes it easier to oppose what, and this, Angela and I may be come from different perspectives on this, okay? But those low prices make it easier to impose regulations that are costly and difficult to comply with for the very industries that have created the low cost of fire. Uh, and so I, I don't think the effect of the low cost environment on policy considerations is nearly as interesting in terms of the work that we've been doing uh, as it is um, in the context of rulemaking. From the administration, uh, on the on the legislative side, I think Angela's right. It allows you to be a little bit more forward-looking. It allows you to be, um, you know, it, it forces you to manufacture your own momentum for sure and to not commit any process fouls because, of course, you're not responding to a crisis. You don't have an excuse to cut corners. Um, the other benefit, frankly, on the legislative side is it, is it makes it easier to avoid really dumb ideas. I mean, you won't find a sin fuels corporation uh, in the Energy Policy Modernization Act of 2016. We are not panicked. Uh, we are not berated every day about why we haven't done something to lower gasoline prices. Uh, and that is a, is a different experience than I think a lot of folks in our situations have had in assembling energy goals over the years. And it's, I think it's preferable um, because, again, you, you, the, the likelihood that you screw something up or you, or you advance what feels like a very good idea only to find out that it was a horrible idea, the odds of all that go down significantly. So I, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a net positive to be legislating in this environment as opposed Great. I want to jump on the, you mentioned infrastructure now twice, it's a, something near and dear to my heart, um, and mostly because I've been on the all-decode access all the time channel, but I'm not starting there. Um, what I'd like to do actually is, is talk about um, how the House and Senate are looking at um, infrastructure. Both bills contain provisions that um, would push FERC along in its environmental review. In particular, the most uh, jurisdictional asset, of course, is natural gas pipelines and uh, LNG facilities as well as hydro facilities. Um, maybe what I'd like to do is explore a little bit, and uh, maybe we'll start with Colin just for fun, is when 
Your side says infrastructure. What does that mean? You know, what are the priorities when it comes to infrastructure that uh, the members of the caucus on the Republican side think about? And then, like Angela talked about, uh, what infrastructure means um, on, the, on the Democrat side. Yeah, I mean, it, it means it means a lot. Just the short version to 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 different members, and there's diversity of opinion within the Republican conference on this. I think for Senator Murkowski. Um, she's consistently focused on the reliability of the energy supply, the affordability of the energy supply, the cleanliness of the energy supply, the diversity of the energy supply. And you, you can't get at any of those issues, and you can't, it's very difficult to improve the situation as it relates to affordability, reliability, diversity and cleanliness, unless you have an infrastructure that is robust and modern and capable of delivering energy to consumers. So that's the, that's her focus. Um, in other realms, infrastructure is just a good excuse to have a fight. I mean, so, as I said earlier, you know, we had this. We started the Congress with this Keystone XL fight. Um, the Dakota Access situation has been a challenging one. Um, all of it, all of it, tends to get back to fairly understandable reactions to folks who who live near the infrastructure that's being built and who who benefits from it. <coughs> Who covers the costs associated with it? Those are those questions become very real when someone actually tries to build this stuff. I mean, it's theoretical when you talk about in you know, the QER. Um, it was a very good document, but of course, it didn't. The one shortcoming is, it, from my perspective, or one of the shortcomings, it didn't provide a roadmap for dealing with these these local challenges that materialize when you try to actually build something. And so, um, I think from Senator Murkowski's perspective, addressing infrastructure is important. It's also very difficult. Um, and if you lose sight of that, uh, you're going to hit a bit of a brick wall, whether you're a project proponent or you're a legislator. I, I will say, so how does that manifest itself for her? I mean, I, in the policy realm, it manifests itself as an insistence upon not straining capital and not leaving companies and people who want to invest in the United States, whether that's for infrastructure or production or storage or delivery, um, all of which implicates infrastructure, not straining the capital of people that are that want to or are willing to invest in the United States, and so, the, and and there is that's an area on infrastructure where there is some common ground, so long as you recognize the answer might be no. It, it's 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 not really a winner from a policy perspective to say the answer has got to be yes, and you, and you have to say yes to the project proponents as soon as humanly possible. There are situations where the environmental outcome associated with building infrastructure and engaging in production are unacceptable to some critical mass of constituents or legislators or, or other stakeholders. Um, but to the extent that we've, we've been looking for common ground on these issues, whether it's you know pipelines, transmission lines, generating assets and the like, I think what you'll see in the energy bill that we're working on is an emphasis on starting to improve the permitting process so that project proponents are receiving a more timely answer, whether the answer is yes or no, um, and, and that they're not left flat in, the in terms of uh, the project that they're advocating for and the investments they're trying to make. Hmm. All right, yeah, so um, you, you articulated 
at the outset three major sort of categories of infrastructure that we'll deal with, LNG, hydro, and pipelines. And I think, yeah, effort anyway, I don't know. And I think, um, you know, our approach to that, um, rolling into this debate, was essentially, listen, we can be for common sense process reforms, but when you get into um, legislating over the top of existing environmental standards, that, that's, where our, that's where our lines sort of um, uh, start to uh, harden. Uh, so we, we have, as it relates to LNG and hydro and pipelines, all sort of taken um, the approach that we will make those common sense process reforms for now. Um, and I think one of the issues that we have sought to address, at least in the hydro case, which is near and dear to our hearts in the Pacific Northwest, obviously, is we have heard for forever that the resource agencies, for example, have um, long struggled with being able to participate in the process. And we've been looking for ways to it, it foster collaboration up front. So the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, um, uh, the Forest Service, um, uh, get involved in the process sooner uh, so you aren't uh, guessing about the lawsuits that come uh, into the process at the back end. So there are those kinds of process reforms that we've been focused on. You asked at the outset, when our bosses think about infrastructure, what kind of infrastructure are they talking about? I think on our side of the aisle, there's a tremendous uh, focus right now on what people see as inevitable enhanced electrification of the economy. And also, we don't exactly know how the electric generating fleet is gonna shake out, given all of these um, different cross currents right now between the increase in natural gas, challenges to the nuclear fleet, uh, uneven penetrations of renewables uh, across different geographies in the country. I know from my boss's perspective, driving investment into the distribution system to make that a more flexible platform and the grid as a platform as a whole is really um, at the top of the list. How you do that is challenging because it is not just regulatory but also involves the tax side of the house. Um, and so, our, and for example, we've had in the not probably not yet ready for prime time category, we've had folks on our side of the aisle propose things like a, um, a, a federal energy storage standard under PURPA. That is a policy that is premature because we're still uh, developing the technology. So our approach to this has been sort of twofold. One, make the investments on the R&D side to drive down the costs of some of these new components of the grid system that are going to make it a more flexible platform going forward. Um, and number two, try and get our arms around um, what it means to drive uh, investment into the transmission and distribution system with the caveat that, of course, the siting issues uh, on transmission in particular are not for the faint of heart um, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. However, uh, if you look at the assumptions about where we will have to build resources to, should the clean power plan uh, survive uh, to meet those mandates, we're going to have to build transmission from where um, uh, the resources can be, in fact, um, generated to where they are needed. So these are some of the issues we're looking at on a going forward basis. Oh, the transmission is so easy. Um, yes. And actually, thinking about what both of you were saying there, and um, one of the things that, of course, an investor looks at when they're looking at a project is, you know, what's the economic upside? And um, we have to balance what we're seeing in electric market. And I know that uh, having followed around with the, um, I followed with power pipes and pollution, so um, on the electric side, many states have turned to their regional transmission organizations to talk about, you know, how they can deal with um, managing their resources, whether it's potential compliance with the clean power plan, whether it's just managing um, how they're going to redeploy their assets with, you know, newly available natural gas, some incredible initiatives on utility scale renewables. I know that Angela Senator Campbell has, you mentioned it earlier, long been concerned about the efficacy of her jurisdictional wholesale markets, and a couple of us have some pretty ugly t shirts from that. Point. Um, both energy bills, of course, on the House as well, um, ask for to get back to Congress regarding the functioning and the performance of capacity markets and the wholesale markets in general. Um, this year, especially, you know, well, this, this Congress, looking at what members were talking about when they, those issues were aired in committee development of the bill, what were some of the issues that folks are concerned about now? Again, you know, we've got low prices um, for energy inputs. You know, has the debate changed since 2000? And, and what are folks' priorities now when they look at what they'd like to see in terms of FERC markets getting better? 
Yeah. Oh yes, the world has changed since then, for sure. I mean, on the capacity market question in particular, I think the trouble spots have really just even just looking at the members of our committee and, and in the Senate who have been concerned are really in, as you know, New England, New York, and to a lesser extent, PJM. And the real question before us is whether the capacity markets are actually producing the build out of the infrastructure needed to meet those capacity constraints. So there have been a lot of concerns in, I, I think, you know, southeastern New England and the lower Hudson Valley and the New, uh, New York ISO has been a particular concern of Senator Schumer and others. There are, there's been less um, talk about the PJM market thus far, but you know we're beginning to hear the rumblings of the renewables developers and that the new market rules are going to um, uh, uh, prioritize um, existing base load, including you know fossil and nuclear. We'll see how that all shakes out. But one of the reasons what you see in the bill are studies is because we know what we don't know. And um, it is true that even charitably speaking, we haven't legislated on electricity policy for, for serious since 2005. In 2007, we did a lot of good things. I see John Jimison here who worked on a lot of these um, uh, issues as well in the R&D space around um, uh, the grid, smart grid, um, and the promise of that. But we really haven't dug into these issues uh, in, for some time. And low, um, far be it for me to give the House much credit for just about anything, but the House Energy and Commerce Committee Subcommittee on Energy actually held a hearing in September trying to get into the deep, uh, it, begin to educate the members about why does the Federal Power Act exist, why does the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act exist, how is technology forcing a change in the regulatory paradigm, which I think are some of the fundamental questions we need to get our arms around. There are a lot of members, uh, Senator Markey and others, my boss, who worked in te technology, um, or were there when the Telecom Act was written way back in the day, who look at this as an analogy to what's happened um, in the telecom sector. That analogy holds in some sense and also falls apart in others. And so we really sort of need to get up the learning curve and also just figure out what's happening in these markets and if they're delivering on the promise and the cost benefit analysis associated with these, these things. Colin, on your side, what, what are the concerns? I know that the Republican. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> Angela's right. We, we need to better inform the conversation as compared to where it currently stands. And that's why in the, in the bill we've written, <clears throat> we have a requirement that transmission organizations report in for a sort of a consistent basis as to how these markets are operating. Um, and I think the most likely outcome is that that information will be used for a subsequent attack to, to, to look at the Federal Power Act and some of these other issues. But we've got a we've got a down payment on on that process and the bill that we're working on now. We also have, you know, in some New England members had asked the Government Accountability Office and our bosses joined in asking the Government Accountability Office. The network has all now been merged. So you have GAO spending um, a lot of time also investigating um, on a parallel track uh, the operation of these markets. And I think that's the safest thing to do right now. I mean, there, there are a lot of different outcomes that folks are seeking as it relates to the rules in these markets and the operation of these markets, whether that's the state level renewable portfolio standards and dealing with, with the effect they're having on the markets um, or a desire to have energy be as affordable as possible because um, that keeps people happy, um, certainly on the, on the political, political end of the spectrum. It's a safer place to be if energy is affordable than if it's expensive. But I will say, though, beyond all the studying that's currently underway on some very complicated market-based questions, Senator Murkowski and Senator Campbell have weighed in pretty proactively in areas where they see problems emerging. So one of those was you know, this um, private cause of action, citizen suits under the Commodity Exchange Act, um, which is kind of kicking this FERC versus CFTC conversation that's played out for years now. That issue kicked around for a while, and, and fairly recently, Senator Campbell, Senator Murkowski, Senator Roberts, and Senator Stabenow, with the Ag Committee, all came together and sent a letter and said, "No, like 
not under the Commodity Exchange Act are we going to have citizen suits. These markets are complicated enough, and, and we're having a hard enough time figuring out what does or doesn't need to be done within that going forward. Let's not complicate this with, with litigation. And of course, the Federal Power Act, which is more squarely in our jurisdiction, doesn't allow for, for that kind of litigation. And so there, you know, there's, I think that's a, a fairly responsible and warranted hybrid of investigating the issue on the one hand and finding ways to, to weigh in on potential problems that materialize in the meantime and say, no, please don't kick open the door to another complicating factor here. Um, and, and otherwise, I think, again, at the risk of giving the House some credit, I mean, they more aggressively than we in the Senate have identified the Federal Power Act and a lot of these issues is sort of the first thing that they'll, they'll focus on in the next Congress, and I think that's probably well, shifting gears a little bit, let's uh, move on from power and one of Senator Kamloff's uh, long-standing priorities to one of Senator Murkowski's long-standing priorities, and that's uh, modernization of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, <clears throat> for those of us in Washington, we know a lot about that, and we know a lot about what um, Senator Murkowski has been uh, talking about in terms of you know what the role of the SPR is, and certainly in the QBR there was also some discussion about whether or not there's a way to redeploy that commitment of assets um, in a different way, away from crude and more towards refined product um, as part of the resiliency strategy. Maybe you could uh, take a few moments to talk about um, <clears throat> those priorities and and how the bill addresses those. Yeah, well, uh, the. The paramount issue for Senator Murkowski on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has actually very little to do with the bill we're working on, and much more to do with the bill's other uh, other committees have assembled. Uh, you know, the, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has become a bit of a piggy bank. Um, it's about $12 billion worth of oil. Uh, sales were authorized for about $12 billion worth of oil to help pay for the highway bill. Um, Senator Murkowski wasn't particularly fond of, uh, of that decision, although, you know, when you really go through the highway bill, there are, in some ways, there's an energy security nexus that he had between domestic transportation and investments in domestic transportation infrastructure and systems and programs, and, and the energy security benefits that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve clearly provides. But, you know, one, the point of departure for her um, is that that can't be habit for that we, we, we're not in a position from an energy security perspective or in terms of our international and domestic legal obligations to be drawing down really any more oil from the strategic control reserve to be paying for other legislative efforts. Um, so that's that's the first thing, and that has that has been a theme this Congress, an unpleasant one. Uh, but it's and it's you know it's not easy for her to be the member who's saying to her colleagues, no, you, you don't get to do that. But that's a role that she's assuming um, in trying to protect the, the strategic petroleum reserve uh, and the energy security benefits that it provides. You know, the the other issue that is that has been squarely addressed legislatively is the fact that, like many pieces of infrastructure, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is in pretty rough shape. Um, very real questions about its ability to deliver oil in a timely manner when it's needed, to the extent that any oil is left after we've sold the paper. Can you tell them a little bit annoyed by uh, the outcome on some of these things? But, uh, that's a big one for her too, and so that that was part of the conversation when Spro sales were put on the table. Was it okay, fine, to the extent that there's an energy security nexus on these other things that you're, that you're trying to use the oil to pay for? Number one, but number two, we've got to devote resources and revenue from those sales to upgrading the underlying infrastructure because you don't know you really need the Spro until you really need the Spro. And at that point, one, it better have oil in it, and two, it better be capable of delivering that oil in a timely manner. Um, and 
I guess my, my last point on Senator Murkowski's behalf on this is that uh, it's easy to get caught up in high production levels and feel like oh, private stocks of oil and domestic production you can bring wells online more quickly than they used to be able to do. Like, they're fairly productive. All those things, from her perspective, lull everyone into a false sense of security about when and if the strategic petroleum reserve might be needed. Um, even if you're self-sufficient in, in producing a lot of the energy resources that are consumed in the United States because of some of the regulatory activity that I've been to. I mean, the, the, the issues associated with energy security aren't just, you know, international incidents that reduce the flow of oil we'd otherwise import into the United States. From Senator Murkowski's perspective, we need to be just as concerned about the effect that some of the regulatory activity we're seeing is having on our ability to produce these resources domestically. And when you take all that together, the, 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 for her, the squirrel feels more important, not less. Um, and she's been, she's been trying to sort of guide the conversation. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, I think they share a lot of this in common. And I think we have a number of colleagues who think the, uh, the Spurs time has come and gone, but it's not all that simple. Um, when you get into the contractual arrangements, et, et cetera, um, for supply in the case of an emergency, um, I think that the need to modernize it is readily apparent in terms of um, the way in which we need to get product to market where it can be refined. That probably requires our ability to enhance our ability to get the product on the water to different parts of the country, or uh, to, frankly, to different parts of the globe. I think my boss maybe even goes a step further than some um, in terms of having giving the um, uh, secretary proactive ability to get ready to uh, release a uh, product from the SPRO uh, because we now can see these extreme weather events coming. It's controversial because people don't want to uh, make it more political. At the same time, it's also true we see um, you know weather events coming a week out now. Um, and we could probably uh, forego some of the economic damage if you were to have a more forward-leaning policy on that. I'd also add that, you know, there's been some talk about refined product reserves. It's an intriguing idea. I think my boss believes that it is probably not universally required. However, um, we actually had a field hearing with Secretary Moniz in Seattle um, over the August recess, and we're all very focused up there. You guys talk about induced seismicity. We've got this thing called the Cascadia Seduction Zone. Not pretty, you know, um, and um, uh, there could be, a, we, we don't know when the big one will hit, but um, all the exercises and whatnot associated with critical infrastructure in the event that a, a large event um, should happen on the West Coast suggests that aviation assets are going to be key to recovery. So in instances in which you can actually identify a um, energy security need, like refined product reserve in the nature of jet fuel, Aviation and maritime assets will be incredibly key um, in our neck of the region in particular because of the bridge infrastructure, all of which quite likely would fall down. So there are, are, are particular instances where we might even make um, expanded investments in those kind of things um, if you uh, believe the forecast about extreme weather and um, um, the geological time period in which some of the, these events could happen. I would also say that one of the things I think was um, productive, except for um, raiding the piggy bank in the transportation bill, was this notion that um, our friends at the Department of Energy would come up with a sort of an energy security valuation methodology. Because if you're, you know, in 1978, a big, uh, a big uh, reservoir of oil was incredibly necessary. But today our energy security challenges are perhaps evolving. Um, again, if you buy the um, logic of enhanced electrification of the economy, maybe we need a transformer reserve. So the world's changing as it relates to the way in which our energy infrastructure is changing, and we shouldn't be solely focused on that. We should be looking to modernize it on an ongoing basis. So more modernization ahead. That's mm -hmm. good. A little bit of common ground, too. That's mm -hmm. always encouraging to discern. What I'd like to do is see if any of you here in the audience have some questions. I have a couple more to keep things rolling, but I know when I'm sitting in the audience, I'd like to have what's burning in my mind go. So, um, any questions from anybody here in the audience? Yes, sir, would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ben 
Schlesinger uh, uh, from Bethesda, Maryland, from uh, some natural gas. I, I'm very concerned, and I think a lot of you are with the uh, apparent energy uh, you know, market failure in New England, uh, where gas hard power plants are being built, but new pipe is not being added. So we do have uh, some provisions to address the, the permanent process for natural gas pipelines, um, but it's not it's not specific to New England or any other region that's struggling with with these constraints, um, and and it's not so aggressive as to box out some of the other perspectives that they just have to be part of the permitting process. You know, so we spent a lot of time talking about the role of resource agencies versus FERC, um, all of which are within our jurisdiction and striking a balance between all of them. And so I, I think the language we have accurately reflects that conversation and it accordingly sets the bar pretty low in terms of how aggressive Congress is in a position to be on pipelines in particular right now as it relates to permitting. I will say, having grown up in Massachusetts, um, I, I'm convinced that so, something bad is going to have to happen before action is taken to address this issue. I think that, that the lights are going to have to go out and, and there's going to have to be some kind of wake up call. I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to understand, again, because I grew up in New England. What are, what's, what are the politics around this? Um, what are the potential solutions? What's contributing to the problem? And I, I just, I don't think people are going to get real about it until, the, until there's a real problem that affects real people. Well, if I could just add to this, I think the problem goes beyond the inability to get the structure of the market. How are we doing? Because the structure of the market Yeah, I would just add to that. I think, um, you know, in our neck of the woods, I've had a conversation with the, a utility CEO who has a natural gas business and an electric business and woke up one morning in, a, in the middle of a cold snap and was sort of like, gosh, I hope I don't have to choose between my electricity customers and my gas customers today because of the increasing interdependence of these infrastructures where the markets are a bit misaligned um, uh, uh, between how you build capacity in each. Uh, FERC a couple years ago began digging into this, and I don't really think we saw anything particularly uh, groundbreaking come out of it as it related to better coordinating between the electricity and natural gas markets. But I think I think it, your your concern is well founded. Um, earlier this year, we um, in fact sent a letter to FERC because we were very concerned in the middle of the summer, depending on forecasts for the weather, uh, what was going to happen in California with the Elisa Canyon natural gas leak because that storage that infrastructure was essentially taken offline for purposes of um, generating uh, power in the summer. So it is an issue uh, that is certainly coming to the fore. The question is, given the fractured regulatory framework and markets around this, how should we address it going forward? The other thing, are they pressing in this room? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, then I won't say what I was going to say. But. <laughs> Off the record, let me also say that I think we're having a very tor off the record. I think we're having a very tortured conversation about how to account for carbon implications of large infrastructure projects, and that's across the board. Obviously, it came to the fore as part of the argument in Keystone. That wasn't why everybody necessarily opposed Keystone who opposed it. We recently saw EPA taking issue with a natural gas pipeline that FERC was moving ahead on because of the carbon footprint. 
potentially of that natural gas pipeline. There's been new guidance issued by CEQ just in the past few months that gives guidance to agencies about how they're supposed to actually take that into account. But it's really still um, uh, it's difficult. Still a little, yes. Yeah. Very much so. Very much so. So you're seeing all this sort of constituent uh, grassroots level angst about building anything at the same time. Um, it's probably not a realistic strategy to oppose every piece of infrastructure that needs to be built. So um, a lot of things um, uh, to consider in this whole dynamic. I walked up here with my dear friend Ben, who's been here for that story. I'm David Knapp, and uh, I'm Chief Energy Economist of uh, Energy Intelligence. I'm sorry for journalists, but I really want you guys. I'm a founding member of this group that I'm on council now, and I'm actually president of the in 2018. Uh, I wanted to go back to the SBR, because some of us are old now, but we were around when there was some scaremongering about it, about the infrastructure, about the quality of the oil, about the in the air, and those kind of things. Uh, and there was an exercise, and yes, it's there, yes, it's the okay quality, and yes, it's sort of doing its job. Clearly, you're both right that the job has changed, but the idea that the piggy bank, once you open it, is broken, and let's get open with a hammer and so you can sort of shake things out of it as needed. Uh, and as a former uh, official of the uh, International Energy Agency, um, they consider, and I think we consider that that has um, rules in it which will be honored what the lead is to the highway fund or other places like that. Um, reconsidering how we want to use it, what our goal is in terms of worldwide like security uh, and all that, uh, it's obviously something that, that demands attention and there should be some guidance on that bill, uh, in the bill, as long as it renews the commitment, which can be there until it goes away, to the, uh, uh, the Energy Policy Act or whatever the, the funding uh, of the United Nations. Um, so I, I just want to uh, give an alternative view that uh, the SPR is not going to want to go away. It should go away. Uh, but certainly, when we're this far above what our obligations are with the international treaty, uh, not that the world is any safer than it was, but there certainly is a lot more oil. So that is, uh, is one way to look at this. I was just wondering if uh, either of you had any strong objections to that. Uh. In general, no. I think, however, there's a delta between our international treaty obligations and then the capacity of the SPRO, because we added it onto it, I believe, during the Bush administration. And it's kind of an irrevocable decision when you get below a, a certain level, even if it's above the 90-day requirement, because of the need to service and potentially close caverns. And so, yeah. And so we just need to understand both the math and the actual infrastructure impacts, right? So. Yeah. Would you turn and face the crowd when you speak? Excuse me. All I would add is, is, is you know, to reinforce my comment earlier, that these things are habit forming. You know, that, that if this strategic petroleum reserve starts to be viewed by legislators as a pay for and not an energy security asset, we have a real problem. So I'm uh, Seth Blumstein from Penn State University. Um, and okay, I'll stand here and I'll face the audience and everybody can hear me. <laughs> um, First panel, we're working out the case. Okay. <laughs> does that work? Oh, that's right. Okay. okay. All right. You can see your smiling face towards the crowd and it's awkward. Um, so I was I was at a conference a few uh, a, a couple of years ago with the CEOs of kind of the major northeastern ISOs, so PJM in New York and New England, and um, us being geeky academics, we asked them what kept them up at night, and we all expected them to say wind, and they, to a man, because they were all men, said natural gas, and so Paul, to your point. I, I think that the, this kind of polar vortex episode a couple of years ago actually did serve as kind of a wake-up call, even though we didn't have massive interruptions related to that. And what you know the CEOs of PJM and New York and New England told us was that this really this event 
really got them to think about the, the value of fuel diversity, which I think, well, I, don't, I don't remember who on the panel mentioned it, but they were really struggling with how they were going to integrate it into the market structures that they had to work with. So they as grid operators had the value of this, but they couldn't quite figure out how that, to get that value reflected in market decisions. And so um, the, the panel brought up fuel diversity and then said nothing about it, which I, um, and so uh, I guess I would like to ask the, the panel how uh, the Congress is thinking about fuel diversity and what role the Congress can even play in encouraging it or ensuring it, who should be in charge of this. Okay, we have five minutes until the end of the panel. <laughs> so, uh, so, Big uh, question. So, yeah, I'll, I'll try to give you a short answer. I mean, I, the, the CEOs of those transmission organizations are probably, they've got to be at or near the top of the list of folks who can diagnose these problems. They are not empowered to do anything about them. And so that's got to be a phenomenally frustrating situation to be in. I mean, I, I, I don't know how they do it. And they, they have been, they've had real wake-up calls, and they've been transmitting warning signs in, in their QER comments and their letters to the Hill and their interactions with agencies and their public statements. Everywhere you go, they're ringing the alarm bell about these things, but they're not, they're, they're not a policy-setting body at the level that the U.S. Congress is or the federal agencies are or the state legislatures they're having. Yeah, they, they always like to describe themselves as policy takers, not policy makers. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Um, and again, I think it's probably very frustrating as a guy who's, who's, I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, as someone who's spent my entire career in a sort of policy making situation, you are empowered if you have the votes to address a problem that you've identified. Um, so look, I, I think, my, my personal opinion in the case of, um, for example, New England, is that the burden is pretty squarely on state legislatures. And I, I, you know, as a guy who works for a senator from Alaska who wants a lot of things to happen in the state that her Senate colleagues are opposed to, I'm hardwired to be deferential to the more local perspective on these things. Senator Murkowski is not going to wander into this conversation and say, here's a bill that I think is needed to micromanage the situation in New England. I think she's much more likely to say the state legislatures need to, because a lot of these problems, not all of them, there's a ton of contributing factors, but a lot of these problems, from my perspective, flow back to decisions that have been made at the state level, not the federal level. And so we, I think it's only fair um, to have the burden for fixing them rest just as squarely on, on those same folks. Well, first off, I would have bet you 10 bucks Terry Boston would have said cybersecurity. security. <laughs> In terms of I, I, was, I was shocked but, that you did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andy likes the gas generator. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but to what Colin said, I think, um, First of all, there are different diversity, obviously there are different diversity um, challenges in different regions of the country, which makes it hard sometimes from our level to prescribe exactly. You know, legislation is a very blunt instrument, very blunt instrument, because all these, um, the infrastructure has grown up to support different aspects of the economy across the country. Um, they talk about the aluminum industry in World War II till the cows come home in the Pacific Northwest and how that's now powering our data intensive economy but we have like a minute. Um, so, you know, I think going back to some of the co uh, conversation we were having earlier, um, Colin mentioned the primacy of the states in many of these conversations. I think one of the challenges is how, to we, how do we imbue this discussion with more regionalization? Um, insofar as if you talk to folks in California or Arizona, really clean power plant compliance stuff, like how they comply has to do with what's happening in the neighboring state and they don't control it, right? And so back to the conversation again about electricity, I think what we are all struggling with, the folks on the House side and our side, is how do we construct an actual constructive conversation about it that just doesn't devolve into feds versus state control? Because that's where we've ended up 
every other time we've tried to take on some of these challenges. And we have so much that is dynamic and happening in these markets between the infrastructure interdependence, between natural gas um, and electricity, what's happening at the distribution level, sort of changing things at the transmission level. There are many different dimensions in which um, the, the, uh, the system is evolving at the moment and how we get our arms around that and perhaps encourage a greater regionalization in these conversations is, I guess, a step in the right direction since there are no simple, easy answers that would apply across the country. Well, I think that's a great question and I think you've teed up excellent conversation for the coffee break, which we get now. So I would like you all to join me in thanking both Colin and Angela for coming. Before you go off to the coffee break, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to be able to introduce uh, our mayor uh, from Tulsa. He was able to join us after all this morning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he will be able to give you a, a, a much better uh, view of Tulsa. As much as I have grown to love Tulsa here in three and a half years, he's been here a little bit longer. Uh, and he also uh, is directly involved in the energy industry. He's the president of Keener Oil and Gas, as well as being our mayor. Uh, so if uh, Mayor Bartley would uh, uh, join, uh, join me up here, and uh, welcome to our I have about a 20-minute discussion I'm kidding. <laughs> Welcome to Tulsa. And I apologize for being late. I had a breakfast meeting this morning and I, we got involved with talking about police activities and parks and all sorts of stuff and it totally left my mind. So I apologize. I'm very, very sorry. Welcome to Tulsa. I'm glad to say that I am in the oil and natural gas industry. I'm the third generation of my family to be involved in the industry, Keener Oil and Gas Company, locally owned. Uh, family-owned, uh, independent uh, exploration and production company. We got our start in Titusville, Pennsylvania, 1900. My grandfather was a clerk at a general store. Uh, it was going out of business. The guy let him take it over. He then uh, began in advancing credit to people in the oil and, oil and gas industry in the area. For collateral, he would take their lease. Apparently, somebody didn't pay off, and he found himself in the oil business. Uh, the, the name Keener, Keener, K W N E R, is a producing sand from that part of Ohio, southwest Pennsylvania, northern West Virginia, etc. So he came down here about 1910. We've been here ever since. The discussion I heard uh, just last several minutes about markets, fascinating discussion. I wish I'd have been here for the start of it. But it, first of all, brings in two, two thoughts. The University of Tulsa, very well known in its ability to educate petroleum engineers for uh, students from literally throughout the world. About half of the number of, uh, of students are from outside of the United States. So they come here to Tulsa for that education. They, uh, several years ago, uh, I was uh, part of a, an effort on TU's part to have uh, a reconstructed energy management school that didn't focus just on one aspect of, of oil and natural gas, but the entirety of the concept of energy, of what that is all about, the markets, the legal aspect, uh, the environmental aspect, obviously the uh, oil and gas aspect as well, the production, the exploration, etc. But when a student graduates with a degree in the energy management school, he or she has a very wide-ranging understanding and experience and exposure to that concept of energy. Who better to understand and to talk about markets or to talk about access to energy or to talk about reasonably priced energy than somebody that has been exposed to all different aspects of it? So that's why I think the University of Tulsa is well positioned and, uh, and they welcome you here. I know they're a major sponsor of this organization. As far as the economics go, when I go to other parts of this uh, country, 
and help wave the flag for Tulsa, Oklahoma to talk about why they should come to Tulsa to relocate their, uh, their uh, company here, etc. I point to the economics, especially in today's environment when the price of oil and natural gas are very low, uh, although it's, uh, both are improving a bit. But when companies are stressed, when the uh, equity providers are stressed, they look for ways to save money, and unfortunately, many times that means laying a lot of people off. And that's very detrimental, obviously, to that person, that person's family, and to the future of the company. So what I do, I say, well, all you have to do is move to Tulsa, because the, economy, the, the economics are in your favor, that anybody that would move their business to Tulsa will have immediate 20% reduction in their cost of doing business to support a staff, an office, etc. And that's compared to Houston, Dallas, uh, Denver, even Oklahoma City in many ways. But the, the economics certainly come into play in a very big way, as you all know. So that's why I have, uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, the last time I was down at the North American Prospect Exposition this last February, we had a list of 25 new startup companies that are located in Tulsa that uh, has now grown to 35 that the $2 billion in equity money that was uh, backing those 25 companies now has grown to about four or five billion back in, back in the new number. So the economics has come into play in a very big way. And when we have such a history and understanding of the significance of the oil and natural gas industry, uh, and a person is there to really espouse the good things about it, the good news for you all is that you're now here to enjoy the quality of life that we have in this city. It's incredible. So, if you want to know more about it, I'd be more than happy to give you a pitch. So, again, I don't want to give the Chamber of Commerce pitch because I would be up here for 20 minutes. I don't want to do that. You have a co coffee break to take. I want to welcome you on behalf of the community of Tulsa to Tulsa. And I hope you experience it. For those of you here the first time, please come back and uh, bring more people with you. And, Appreciate the money you spend here very much. <laughs> 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 Thank you.